supposed to be a career establishment. This union has used the education department to give real career meaning to all our members, not just the usual promotional opportunity stuff, but we have the best high school equivalency program to make sure that we don't have dead-end people on the job. We've had 500 people graduate. We've got another 500 who are now in the process of graduating. Now, the reason we need this, it's the lead-in to our career development. So they get the high school credentials, so they can promote upward and develop upward. The nurses' aides to licensed practical nurses. The custodial assistants to supervisors. So this is what we've been doing. We keep looking at that and giving them an education alarm to help their going up. Your steward training, for example, goes on all the time. The steward is really the key to the union. Don't let anybody kid you. We don't say it as a morale builder or a shibboleth. You got a good steward system, you know what's going on. Whenever a local unionist says, you know, how come you haven't trained the stewards? Man, that's a, a sign, go, and we go. Now, can we get uh, at least two persons who will play the, uh, one who will play the role of the supervisor? Would you play the role of a supervisor? Who will play the role of the steward? I would. All right, you will play the role of the steward. Uh, who will play the role of the employee? Okay, would you all three come up here now and take chairs, take a chair here. Uh, I want you to do this as if you were doing this in the, uh, in the hospital itself. I would assume that we open up, the steward comes in, you say hello, and you pick it up from there. Yeah. Joan. Uh, how are you, Mrs. Uh, Massey? Yeah. Well, the problem here is that Mrs. Roma has been absent from her job Thursday and Friday of last week and Monday of this week. Now. I have a job to do, and I have reprimanded her and told her that she cannot take any more time off, and I will take two days away from her for being out. We have patients here, which is my first concern, and though, although I know she has the problem with her child, patients do come first in the hospital. Well, now, Ms. Jones, the first thing I'd like to say uh, is that you uh, I understand your sympathy in saying that the patient do come first, but in this woman's case, uh, you can't say that a patient would come first to her because her child has to come first to her. Now, uh, my, my, uh, my, might I just interject in one moment, please? I, I want to ask you something, Mrs. Jones. Did you not know that I was, that child was sick from Monday on, and I had a babysitter for those three first three days, but on Thursday, Friday, and Monday, the sitter couldn't come. I did try coming in. I worked Monday through Wednesday, did I not? You well, knew the child was sick. Well, may I say something, Mrs. Roma? I have your record here, and it's very bad. Now, Unfortunately, the child is a sick child. Uh, I don't yeah. say that because I don't want to. And you know what? I work, I still I have a hospital here, and we have patients here. And I'm sorry, you will have to make other arrangements. I have to. I called up the doctor, Dr. Schneider, and I spoke to him myself. And uh, he was very kind uh, to uh, say that he would give me a letter stating that she does have a child that is very ill and that this child does take her, to, has to have her own attention. She cannot have babysitters to take care of the sick child. And well, uh, I, will, I, I, will have, I will have to write and her I up. I will have to write her up and, give, and send her some because we cannot have a person staying out two and three times a week well, that she has a child or not. Yeah. Well, you, well, if you do that, but I will definitely fight that because I think well, it is unfair you know and unjust. That, but until you I do don't that. know if you know what justice is. Until but you do that, Mrs. Matthews, well, I'm going to do it immediately. I will have to write her up and send it up there. I am going to do it I have the boss on my back, I don't and I have to take care of my back. position. You're going to have me on your back, and when you have me on your back, you got somebody on your back. It was a lovely situation, wasn't it? Now, is this, may this be typical? Okay. I would not have let that supervisor draw me out into a fight because that was not the arena to fight in. I would simply have advised that supervisor that where she has a twofold obligation an obligation to her employer as well as to that employee. Today I see you the pacifist. <laughs>
We had a steward who stood her ground, who spoke as an equal with the supervisor. She wasn't uh, intimidated by the tone of the supervisor. She referred to the contract when necessary. Uh, she decided to avail herself of the second step of the grievance procedure when she found that she did not get a solution or a proper answer. And, the re and it, it was a wonderful illustration of what the steward is supposed to be like, and I hope she will serve as a model to all of you in the work you will be doing from now on. And thank you for the excellent work and participation and your time that you've given all this week. This union does more collective bargaining than almost all the other unions in the city put together. We have literally hundreds of titles, so we're always in bargaining. I'm not going to say it here. When you meet over a period of years with a chief negotiator for management like Herb Haber, you just have to get to know each other. What he understands about me, and he once said it, and I thought it was a great compliment, that I'm a lovely guy, but if I hurt any of the workers I represented, I'd cut out his belly button. And he's right, I would. As I thought would happen, the guidelines are very obtuse. Nobody really knows what they mean. We feel that we were caught in the squeeze where we would have had a contract and Washington would have to judge it. We'll let Washington judge it. We don't believe we ought to continue to be punished. I told the group that, you know, that I'd like for them to hear your side of the thing. But I also told them quite candidly that we can't keep this dance going. We have some areas in the, in the realm of efficiency and productivity that I think need to be discussed and need to be developed. I happen to understand productivity. The mayor really doesn't. I happen to understand efficiency. I don't think the mayor really does. So I don't want to use it as a slogan. But the point that I'm saying is that, in, in, in fact, in most of the productivity in which this union's been involved, the union instituted it, between they and me. The upgrading of nurses' aides for greater job responsibility, the roving crews and parks the union, the union presented and worked on, the upgrading of custodial assistance so they can become supervisory personnel the union work done. So we're not afraid of it. It's not simply a question of providing these opportunities for people to upgrade themselves, but I agree with you. That's, that serves a double, a double goal. We're very happy to provide ways and means of providing opportunities for people to upgrade themselves, particularly when that also provides the city with a higher degree of service and flexibility and so oh, on. But that's efficiency. But, yeah, I, I agree. Efficiency. You're, you're arguing my point. Efficiency well, I'd like and see, productivity. I'd like to see Hamilton and Lindsay talk about it. Well, that's the mayor right. has. Uh, yeah, except Vic, he doesn't, despite, know, what, despite except he doesn't standards. know what the hell he's talking about. Well, so. I, you know that we have a basic disagreement uh, on that point. He not only knows what he's talking about in these areas, but he's galvanized a lot of his departments and his agencies. You work for him, and I work for him. You work for him, I and work I work for him, and you work against and him. And I work for the horny-handed sons of toil. That's the big difference. Well, I, I like to think that we're both doing really the same thing, that yeah. we ultimately have common goals. In any event, I think the resolution of our problem lies in this area. We've been banging you for a, an educational fund. Uh, we have one. The high school equivalency stems from that. College credit stems from it. It's been very successful. This doesn't add one nickel to the worker's salary. He doesn't get it. It goes into schooling. What is the schooling utilized for in career service? If a man goes to college and picks up some credits, it makes him more efficient. When you establish an educational fund for uh, workers who are at the lowest salary levels, it's appropriate. When it starts going up higher, it begins <coughs> to fritter away in our judgment. It doesn't really solve the basic problem. But that's productivity. But, right? Well, no, really I don't is. think, I think it's productivity. I think it's measure of productivity is when you utilize it at your, at your lowest levels of employment for people who come in at the bottom of the, it's of a new the definition. line. Really a new definition. No, I don't think. It well, is. This, is, uh, this is our judgment of it. I think there is where it has validity. There is where it needs to be considered. But we have an additional problem, Vic, because under the freeze, we are limited in the amount of money that we can spend. And if we put any money, if we agree that this is a sound and valid place to go, Monies that are put there will come out of the basic That's crazy. Package. You obviously don't have uh, city hall guidelines. If you say that you've got a productivity factor, this has got to come down the pipe. The only other caveat that I throw at the table, the only other happy warning I give you, Herb, start throwing money. 
start throwing money on the table with it so we can eat while we're debating. I represent a lot of grubby people who are making 7000 a year, and they don't know how to spend it, though. They're making so much herb. They're really going mad with power. Yeah, but they really waste it. They spend it on some crummy stuff like food and clothing. I warn them against this. But I'm saying to her that we really need within the next couple of weeks some bedrock negotiations. That I say to I you. Agree. If not, I just take it away from the table. I'm going to take it away from the table because it's silly, you know, playing back and forth. The popular mind, the editorials of the New York Times, makes our production for the members contrary to the needs of society. Pure crap. Giving a hospital worker seven or eight thousand dollars a year is not a detriment to society. Giving a man a decent pension in his old age is not a detriment to society. That's phony, and it's contradictory. Make the man a whole man, and you make a better society. Your strength is based on what you produce for the rank and file, and how you produce it with them. The more they are involved in that production, the stronger you are. The more they feel a part of the union, the stronger they are. No, what I'm saying. Hold it, hold it. No, 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 Any equipment in the park department, whether it be in forestry, in the shops, or out in the field, the trucks belong to the motor vehicle operators. That's their title in the city of New York, to drive all equipment for the city of New York. You have a man getting $13,000 driving a vehicle, which is out of title, and a man is sitting down $7,000, that's all he gets for a st starting salary. A motor vehicle operator. Why doesn't the city put a motor vehicle operator on that truck for $7,000 rather than have a man that's a qualified tree surgeon, $13,000, riding behind a, a wheel of a truck, driving a truck? What is he doing after uh, Mr. Now, let's get that straight. Every negotiation we have motor vehicle operators hired for. Why do we have motor vehicle, have motor vehicle time operators time hired for? Do we hire time. forestry men to drive? to drive Thanks. trucks, or do we have motor yeah, vehicle operators? Service. We have motor vehicle, that's your interpretation of a crew service. I'll take and show you a truck down there that's 20,000 pounds. That's a motor vehicle operator. It's a responsibility to drive through a city street. It is And not. you have to have professional man behind that wheel. You You're don't not a take professional. Let's get Who's something not a straight. Professional? Listen to me. Who's not a professional? You're not a professional. I'm a professional driver. Yeah. For the city of New York, I had to take an examination, and I had a pass. You are a civil servant who took an exam. Now, Tom Lurie, you know this for a fact. I brought this out before the Department of Personnel three years ago when I went to a meeting. And she told me that she was going to look into this and have things taken care of. Not a thing was done. Go around the city of New York and see what's being done in the park department. Because of lack of coverage. And you got your laborers that belong in these playgrounds driving the vehicles all over the city of New York. You now, get them off the truck, you know what he's saying save you? money, I understand what and get saying. the place what do you straight want? Now, wait, wait a second. What you know what he's saying here? Well, you know what he's all. saying here? Seriously. Wait, it's, a, it's a beautiful yeah, point. Yeah, I know it's a beautiful point. productivity was both ways. You had a court case back in 66. Both ways. Productivity. Both ways. Productivity, both ways. baby. I'm saving both your money ways. without productivity. Yeah, I'm saving your care. Beautiful. You saved me money. I'll save you care. Uh, like some of those fire anything. officers driving in City Hall, double of the MVO guys, and they sit on their ass much better because they got bigger behind. Right. Yes, that's right. Oh, I watched yours spreading, too. Well, well you no, 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 Let me say this to you. First of all, as I said before, you don't have it in your contract. Every time you come into negotiations, you want that provision in, and the city will not agree to it. You got sanitation vehicles, uh, big uh, so it's laying against no, the wall, no, not getting anything. They're no, laying no, against no. the wall, Tom. And you got three me, laborers that should stuff. be in different parts departments working, me, and you got them running around the city doing nothing. Let me talk to this. Doing point. nothing. I, I think I think a very important point is made here. Efficiency and productivity works both ways. Some of the most inefficient practices come from you guys. I don't have to tell you about the, the high cost drivers. Joey was just mentioning it to you. Now, it seems to me if we want to get one house in order, we ought to get them all in order. If you don't want him sitting on his duff, we don't want a $13,000 or $12,000 a year man driving the, the vehicle. Maybe efficiency from your side can match efficiency from our side. No, let's go a little further than that. On some of these small agencies, we only have a few MVOs that may drive a commissioner or maybe a deputy. Majority of the time, He's just sitting in the office. And when he sits in the office, he don't sit by himself. He's sitting and he talks to somebody else. So I don't have just one person doing nothing. I end up with two people doing nothing. You say these fellas driving these big commissioners are sitting on their butt doing nothing. 
I have to differ with you. I've been doing it for 19 years, and I'm in sanitation. I've been driving the big bosses. I've been bringing people to and fro. That car never stands still. Every time an NBA wants to do something different, give me a little more production, we're being stopped by somebody else. It's not our job. You're not supposed to do it. So we're trying to show productivity. Wonderful, you're doing it. That's what we want. But everybody isn't like you. Well, you're right. No, no, don't, don't go cuss away me. Saying? My oh, whole MBO oh, oh, in whole oh, sanitation. Oh, hold it already, will you? For Christ's sake, I want to move on. You're holding it already. Let's get a clarification before we're going to fight. We're not going to get it. Mr. Laura, you're going to have what a What does it mean? But no, no, Joseph, I just want to. The meaning. Just, no, no, just one second. One, one clarification. He's no. under the opinion that his chauffeur sits on his butt. Now, hold on a second. Just a minute. Come on, Tom, answer this one. Do you, did you ever drive a truck around the city of New York? Try it someday and see if you're sitting on your butt doing nothing. Hold it a minute. For Christ's sake. Gotta change the image here. You are a wild group, you are. You are a wild group. We are. God damn it. One of the conflicts people talk about is the fact that the unions are asking for more money while the city is starving. If the unions didn't ask for more money, the city would still be starving. Don't people realize this? That the reason for the bankruptcy has nothing to do with the workers? That there are non-unionized cities that are going down the drain? Don't they know what's happening to the cities? That enough money isn't coming in? That there's an $81 billion war budget? That you just can't build enough schools? That you just don't have the health services? What in the hell has that got to do with $7,000 a year for a hospital worker? Everyone knows it's nonsense, but they play the game. We talk about increased efficiency and productivity. Well, it'll have to start with the mayor first, who's terribly inefficient. And then let's work it out. And you know something? You'll get all the increased efficiency, all the increased productivity, and you won't get gigantic wage increases. Guess what? There will not be enough money to run the cities. Because the real contradiction, the real disparity, is people want more and more service, more cops on the beat, smaller classrooms for their kids, better highways, and then when it comes to paying for it, to hell with it. I spend more time worrying about enough income in terms of the city and the city services and where we go, as I do on almost anything else in the union spectrum. It's yeah. becoming ridiculous. You know, it's stuff the members don't see. It's hard to convey. It's the most critical aspect now of our work. Unbelievable. And you need a positive program. Except because the time is short and the legislators are always in session, you've got to catch them where they are, in the hallways, in the john, anywhere. Sometimes I can have the leisure of meeting them in the office and sitting down and really having a long conversation, but that's very rare indeed. I was telling John, seriously, I was just saying in that, we come down to this poll every year with the same crisis that your chief executive visits on it. Seriously, Tom, when the hell is this going to stop? Well, There's got to be some sense to a budget in this damn town. Really I does. agree that uh, from the outsider looking in, it looks like uh, complete chaos because of the combination of several factors. Not only inflation, but uh, unemployment, uh, which uh, obviously uh, uh, made the anticipated revenues go way out of whack. And uh, the, the general problem of um, uh, increasing local government and uh, state government costs that can't possibly be met by their tax base. But I, I, I really, you know, I, I don't know how we can have a hodgepodge tax system where well, you don't set up a progressive income tax thing, where the thing isn't levied one on the other. Uh, well, I'm sorry, I really all, am, Tom. I just don't know what tax, the hell's going here. No, I, agree, I agree with you, I agree with you. But whether we like it or not, a progressive tax, which would be obviously an income tax, is, is uh, too rough for us now because we've got the highest progressive tax in the country. Your own members are the uh, best look, paid, where they best pension on? plan. Uh, no, the almost, almost had the best pension plan. Well, almost. Well, but the still, yeah, you're almost. way ahead of ever, comparable workers elsewhere. It's in the private a area, not in the private area. Probably, a, a, private probably area. a tribute to your leadership, but also a, a tribute to the political uh, clout that your group has had. And this has complicated our problems. Complicated the problem in New York oh, City. Where are we you're going? setting too tough a pace. Seriously, where are we going in this session? Very frankly, uh, this session, uh, the governor's got the only viable plan that uh, should be enacted. There's, there's no alternative. The bell is ringing the Senate. Yeah.
It just gets worse and worse and worse and worse each year. Right. Then where do we go with it? You see, this is my point. If you, if you well, I want to be it. very brutally frank with you, Vic. Uh, I think that you uh, would be the first one to realize, uh, you and John Cochran, who practically live here with us, that uh, if we had a Democratic majority or a Democratic governor, uh, you wouldn't be faced with these kind of uh, uh, ridiculous and uh, backward uh, problems that we face here. We ain't got one, Stanley. That's true. We ain't got one. So, you know, in terms of your political needs for this next election, the governor screwed up because he didn't give us a decent tax package, so he has to tax in an election year. Maybe the name of the game is to let it be his tax package with our amendments that might take care of the thing. Now, if we were to do as you suggest, which is to buy the governor's package... No, I didn't suggest that. I said well, so to take a piece of it and then add on at least part of your own program. Well, if we can add on, that's all right. But the highest okay, tax yeah. rate now in New York is 14%. You want to make it 14 to 17. Right. right. So it's stick it with this one. Well, well we, we, can't, we are. But stick it... What I'm trying to say is to stick it on top of this package, Al. Neither one of us have the power to make the final decision. Yeah, but the question is, who does the governor bring in? Who do you guys bring in? Joe, I See, this is the point. If we can avoid the catastrophes that we're all concerned about, I am willing to talk. And I will. What's up? The session started again. I think we'd better get out there. I want to wish you nothing but the best. And a happy year. But I fear the worst. I have lots of disagreements and arguments with my friends and colleagues in the labor movement. They see the legislative process, political issues, from a narrow bread and butter stance. Understandable in a way. They've gotten bread for their members, and this was a very, very important mark of success. But because of it, they've strayed away from the social issues, the real issues of our time. What's going on in the black community, the discontent of the kids, the war, the sterility of the war. This seems to escape them. And because of it, we're failing of purpose the same way the rest of the country is failing of purpose. And this disturbs me because I love the movement, and the movement is important. I see a lot of the younger leadership that's restless and want to speak out more within the movement and externally within the community. But as long as the old God sits on him and demands a kind of a monolithic adherence and loyalty. You know, unity is a real morality in the labor movement. And we use it to cloak honest, constructive dissent. As long as they keep doing this, we will be in trouble. But I do believe these younger men coming up will be heard. For myself, as I watch the scene, I don't want to get that old. I don't want to get that encrusted. I want to retire when I'm still young. I want to keep the democratic ferment alive that exists within Council 37. I never want that to diminish. I want the delegates to speak up. I want to hear from the executive board. I want a give and take that is very, very healthy indeed. You don't have this, it seems to me that we lose the flavor of what the movement means. Because this movement was born in dissent. If we don't have dissent, then what are we? All those in favor signify by raising your hand. The secretary to the county. All those opposed, raise your hand.